All right. Well, um, yeah, we've got we've got fifty five on. It's, we're almost five minutes in, and so um, looks like a few were waiting um, prior. We had um, more than a hundred register from eighty three different organisations, Doug. So there's been a, a bit of interest generated in only you know only two weeks that we've um, been letting people know this is this is happening. So there's definitely appears to be a lot of interest in infonomics and um, and ways to leverage information for um for for the better good and uh so i think i'll let neil introduce you doug because uh, i know that you guys had a, a good relationship for for quite a while and um we're only just starting our journey so probably best that that neil takes the honors there no oh, thanks scott um no it's a great pleasure to have doug join us um i've known doug now for or oh, maybe four years, um, really through the link journey. Uh, he he and I met when he was at Gartner. Um, we were building our platform out. Um, information value has been a key attribute of the link platform ever since we we started building it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we found Doug through the Gartner partner network. Um, and he was writing this book called Infonomics. And really, that was the connect point. So I, I've been lucky enough to have met him several times. We co-presented on information governance and infonomic summits in the US. Um, then, of course, COVID came along. So we co-presented in, in Verbello, which is the virtual platform. Um, it's always fantastic to have Doug share his insights about such, well, what I believe is a, um, a really important topic, which is you know information managed as an asset inside the business, enabling data-driven decision-making um, and and having people um, become literate in talking about data and information as part of the fabric of what the organization does. And there's, there's no one better really in sharing case studies and thought leadership about um, how we get there, which I think is the journey that many of us still have to go on as part of being in the digital economy. So Doug, thanks ever so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and share your insights on this part of the world and hopefully one day uh we will get you over here in person and we can you know do this great to, great to get back one of my favorite places in the world thanks thanks neil for the introduction and um, inviting me on the on the call today so uh yeah appreciate it um i guess i've got some materials to share uh, we'll make this interactive so neil uh, you know feel free to jump in and add add some color obviously anytime um mm -hmm. well there we go um, so recently I joined a firm called uh, West Monroe Partners based here in Chicago. Um, some folks formerly from Arthur Anderson, um, and after that kind of went, went, went sideways, if you know that story, um, they, they formed um, West Monroe, a real different kind of culture, entirely um, employee owned. And um, they brought me in as an innovation fellow, not actually a you know, partner director, but someone who's working in both internally and externally to drive thought leadership. Um, an opportunity around the, the topic of, of data, you know, pretty much data and, and, and analytics. Um, so West Monroe is a business and technology consulting firm focused on them, um, mostly on the mid market, um, but but upper end as well. And um, uh, yeah, we've, one of the interesting things that, that we do is we do tech advise, we do a due diligence advisory. So we'll we'll advise on hundreds of um, M and A. Uh, deals or, or corporate transactions per year. And uh, one of the things that we're introducing here is this idea of uh, what I call data diligence. And um, it's a it's a component of, of due diligence in which you're also assessing the value of a company's data assets as part of that transaction. Um, and looking at it not just quantitatively in terms of um, uh, the, the economic or financial value proposition, but also looking at things like the quality and how well the data is managed and, and the, the organization that's structured around around managing and leveraging data. So that's something that we'll be introducing to really differentiate um, the kind of due diligence and tech diligence work that, that we do versus uh, anyone else. All right, so that's enough about that. Um, uh, so a little bit about me and how to reach me. Um, as Neil mentioned, I, I published this book, Infonomics, uh, a couple of years ago on how to manage and monetize and measure data as an actual corporate asset. Um, I'll tell you a little bit of a, a backdrop on, on the story here in, in a moment. Um, so back after the, um, the, the, the story of Infonomics kind of starts with the 9-11 um, terrorist attacks here in, in the States, and um, some clients started contacting us while I was with Gartner, the advisory firm Gartner, after the, the attacks. And 
lamenting not only, of course, the tragic loss of life, but also the loss of their data. And uh, this, of course, was in the days before a lot of cloud um, or offsite backups, and companies actually lost their data. You know, today, when we talk about somebody losing their data, it's often about them, um, uh, you know, it's being hijacked, right? It's not actually lost or, or maybe it's been damaged. So what happened with some of these companies is they submitted claims to their insurers for the value of the data they lost or attempted to, and the insurers uh, denied those claims, suggesting that data was not a uh, not an asset, not, a, not considered property. And uh, so that kind of caught my attention and I started uh, you know, investigating, you know, why isn't data property, isn't it an asset? Um, and I looked up kind of the definition of an asset and, and uh, you know, quickly realized that you know, while information meets the criteria of an asset, it's not um, considered a, a balance sheet asset. Um, and so what, what happened um, after 9-11 was there were some court cases that ensued where, where companies claimed that you know, data was, was damaged or stolen or misused and the courts have internationally have fallen on, on either side of that issue. Some courts suggesting that um, data should be considered property because it can be represented by you know, bubbles on an optical disk or it can be um, printed. And other courts have suggested uh, ridiculous um, things like, well, since, uh, since electrons have negligible mass, <laughs> data shouldn't be considered uh, property. So that's the kind of you know, crazy world we live in right now. And then enter the accountants who said, well, if the, if the courts aren't going to be consistent in recognizing data as a property, we're not going to recognize it as an asset. And even if you wanted to put the value or you had previously put the value of your data on your balance sheet, now you are not allowed to. Um, it's not considered a, a balance sheet asset. And then, you know, next, uh, the, 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 some of the governments got involved and there were a number of rulings or, or kind of around the world or, or um, hearings. Uh, one here in the States was a U.S. Senate hearing in which some um, accounting firms, large accounting firms testified that the lack of ability to quantify data's value has led to undue market volatility. And um, so given that it was a, a U.S. Senate hearing, um, the outcome, of course, was <laughs> nothing happened. So that's the kind of uh, world we live in right now. And it kind of got my attention and it occurred to me that, you know, perhaps this is why organizations aren't particularly good at managing their data, at least with the same discipline as their other assets, because they don't, um, they don't measure it the same way as they do their, their other balance sheet assets. We'll get to that in, in a bit. Um, there's another common meme here, which is information is the new oil, which, you know, when I hear it, uh, you, you know, it certainly um, represents that someone recognizes that data has value, but it entirely misses the point that data has these unique economic characteristics that make it uh, quite a bit more valuable potentially than oil. You know, when you consume a drop of oil, it, it's gone. It turns into heat and, and uh, you know, pollutants uh, and energy. When you consume a drop of information or a unit of information, it, it persists. It doesn't go away. Um, in fact, you can use it again and again. And when you do use information, you can use it multiple ways simultaneously, unlike, again, a drop of oil, which you can only use it one way. Um, the other kind of third main, main difference is that um, data tends to be regenerative. It is um, something that whenever you're using data, it typically creates more data. Um, wherever you're using it in, in terms of a business process, especially today as things like IoT uh, devices are, are generating more, more data. So there's a, there are a lot of differences. And at the core of Infonomics is this concept that information has these unique economic principles that should be recognized and capitalized on by, by organizations. Um, so then I, I started um, kind of asking the question, you know, is information an asset? And I, I kind of... Um, discussed this a little bit already. And, and no matter what definition of an asset you look at, whether it's a dictionary definition or a, um, uh, an accounting firm you know, definition, uh, there really are main, three main components to what an asset is. It's something that's owned, something that's controlled, uh, owned or controlled, something that's exchangeable for cash and something that generates um, economic value or as accountants call it, probable future economic value, which is interesting in itself because there are a lot of people, you'll hear pundits say, well, data only has value once it's used. Well, that's an entirely inconsistent with the way that other assets are valued. Many other assets are valued at their cost basis or at their potential market value, even before you actually use them. So there's no reason that we shouldn't be thinking about you know, measuring data in a, in a, similar, in a similar vein. Um, 
but um, you know, more to the point, does, does data actually have value or are companies that are more data centric, you know, do they, do they actually benefit in some way? And so some research that I did back while I was with Gartner, we, we found that, um, that of course, uh, data product companies, companies that are in the business of selling data or, or primarily monetizing data in some way, they have a, a market to book value ratio that's nearly three times higher than the market average. But even companies that aren't in the data business uh, benefit if they exhibit these kinds of behaviors um, behaviors like having a chief data officer or having an enterprise data governance function um, or a data science organization. Uh, what we find is that those kinds of companies have a market to book value ratio that's nearly two times higher than the market average. I'm not suggesting that there's a, you know, a necessarily a causal relationship, but certainly it's, it's a high enough uh, correlation to be, uh, I think, significant and um, you know, something particularly interesting. I, I don't think there's a better argument um, for an executive team to manage their data as an asset than, than, than this really. Okay. Um, I mentioned the book already. Here's some nice things people who aren't my family uh, actually said, said about the, uh, the book. Um, but the, the, the core of the, the book really gets down to three components, the monetizing, managing, and measuring information uh, as an asset. And the way that they all fit together is um, along the lines of the, the, you know, the common adage, which is you can't, manage what you don't measure or you can't manage well what you don't measure well. Um, and so because most companies don't measure their the value of their data, um, even the quality characteristics of it, let alone its, its economic or financial value, um, that they're in a poor position to manage it. It's hard to get budget you know, for something or resources um, to manage something that you're not measuring you know, the value of, the, the, the value of its just sitting there or the value when it's, when it's actually used. Um, and I think it also follows that um, you can't monetize that which you're not managing well. Um, and by monetize, I'm, I'm pretty liberal in, in you know, how I talk about that. It's, it really is about generating economic value from, from data. So the way that Infonomics kind of all flows together is you know, that we think there's an imperative to measure data's value so that you can get the resources to manage it better or at least have, have a visibility into how it should be managed better. And then once you're managing it better, then you're in a much better position to generate economic value from it. Um, so that's how this all kind of fits together. And I'll give you a little bit of a, a taste on, on each of these. In terms of monetizing data, there really are a number of ways to go about this. And over the years, I've compiled uh, hundreds of use cases on how organizations are using data and analytics in innovative ways. And I'll be publishing a book here in the coming months uh, that's a kind of a compendium of those use cases uh, or some of my favorite ones. And uh, what I did when I looked across all of these use cases, I found that that there are some uh, um, similar patterns that emerge. And some of those are about using data indirectly to generate value more internally, and others are more about using it more directly or generate more direct value from, from data um, by exposing it externally. And so um, you know, we can use data to reduce risks or improve processes or use data to, uh, say, from social media to understand new markets. Um, we can use data more directly with customers or partners or suppliers to improve relationships, to barter or trade with information, uh, to sell it directly, or maybe just sell the insights that we're able to glean from data. And then one that's really emerged a lot because of uh, various privacy regulations like the GDPR and the California Privacy Act um, are that, you know, I can't sell you my data, my customer data, but um, I can sell in, I can sell your stuff to my customers without having to expose who they are. And so that kind of inverted data monetization model is something that I didn't write about, but has really kind of cropped up with, um, you know, particularly with hospitals and banks and others and highly regulated industries where they're, they're very buttoned up when it comes to sharing customer data. So, you know, anyone who says, yeah, we can't monetize our customer data, well, that's entirely untrue. They're just not thinking um, really uh, laterally about, uh, about how to do it. Um, there are various methods to monetizing data. Uh, and, and really, I, I'm the first one to admit that there's not a lot new about uh, Infonomics. It's about applying well-honed asset management and valuation and, uh, and, and value delivery mechanisms to information. And so for monetizing data, we really just want to kind of follow a standard product management approach to doing that. But there are some unique nuances to it, like, well, because it's sort of a new thing, we might want to borrow from others. I often get asked, you know, as a as a consultant, what are others in my industry doing um, 
and and I'll my flippant <laughs> response is, you know, why do you want to be in second place or third place? Why not borrow ideas from other industries? Like if you're in a manufacturer, maybe borrow ideas from the banking industry or the insurance industry on how they're already monetizing their data, or borrow ideas from, you know. Uh, you know, Amazon or Google or someone, you're not going to become them, but some of the ideas that they have about how to generate value from data are certainly legitimate in any business context. The other thing that's unique is that there's a lot of valuable data externally. Um, and you don't need to just get fixated on the data within your own four walls. There's data available from open data sources, you know, thousands of open data sources or millions actually, um, billions of websites and, and thousands of syndicated data providers. So, um, having somebody who's like a curator of that data, I think is really important. And, and while I don't remember who said it first, but um, that maybe it was McKinsey, that um, the, the data scientist job is the sexiest job of the 21st century. I think not far behind it, maybe not quite as, uh, as sexy, but maybe more brawny is, um, is the role of the data curator. Somebody who's out there identifying external data assets um, that are potentially useful and, and valuable to the, the organization. Um, but basically, we're just kind of following the same sort of approach that we would with any kind of new product in introduction. Um, the way to generate a lot of value from data, obviously, is by layering analytics on a data alone or raw data, just like raw wheat from a wheat field is not as, as valuable as it is once it's processed. And so we want to do some things to, to data to, to process it and make it that much more consumable. Now, we over the last 30 years have been fixated with enterprise reporting and hindsight oriented reporting and what happened and what did we sell last quarter and stuff like that. Um, the real value proposition comes when we start asking more sophisticated questions like, why did it happen? What's going to happen and how can we make something happen? That's where things get really interested in, interesting and where the real value proposition is. The problem is that takes a lot of data to bring it together. Um, it takes some um, higher order skills and technologies to, um, to address those kinds of questions. But we think that there's a, a real true imperative for moving up this, this continuum. In fact, 95 to probably 97% of the hundreds of use cases that I've compiled are on the right side of this, this continuum. Almost none of them have anything to do with looking into the, you know, just strictly looking into the past, All right? Um, there's plenty of examples out there of how, how companies have generated value from data. Um, Neil, I don't know if you want me to, to share a couple of examples. If we have some time for that, I'm happy to, to share a few examples. Oh, yeah, please do, Doug. They yeah, yeah. really <clears throat> to like. So, um, you know, Walmart, um, you know, has a has a wonderful search engine and um, and they have they have had one for, for years that takes into account the millions and millions of, of searches that are done each month. Um, but one week they realized that people were searching for a certain term that um, was re resulting in a high degree of shopping cart abandonment. And so they looked into what that term was and the term was the word house. And it was taking people to housing goods and housewares and so forth. And when they analyzed it, they realized that, um, that the, the searches for that word house actually coincided with the season premiere of the, uh, the television show um, House, um, the, the, the medical drama, which um, uh, hopefully you, you get uh, down under as well, starring Hugh Laurie. Um, and what people were looking for, obviously, was the box DVD set of of uh, the, the, the previous seasons. And so what Walmart realized was that while their search engine was great, uh, it was failing to take into account what was trending in the world. And once they upgraded that search engine to consider Twitter and, and Facebook and other kinds of trends, um, they were able to reduce shopping cart abandonment by 10 to 15% across the board. Um, and in Walmart terms, that's like, you know, a billion dollars a year or something. Um, a small insurance company in the southeastern U.S., Infinity Insurance, realized they were sitting on um, 10 years of archived what are called adjuster reports. I'm not sure if you use the same terminology, but it's a report that uh, once a claim comes in, somebody investigates it to determine its uh, legitimacy. And uh, they realized that uh, if they were to text mine those adjuster reports, they could identify certain kinds of phrases or words or omissions that were indicative of fraudulent claims. And they were able to subrogate tens of millions of dollars of previously paid out um, fraudulent claims. Um, Lockheed Martin, a, a large um, a manufacturer of, of, of military planes and, and so forth, um, you know, I spoke at a, in an event some years ago about the concept of dark data and how companies were sitting on this unused data that they were were not, you know, just not leveraging well. 
<clears throat> and um, someone asked, you know, what dark data could we have? And I said, well, you're probably sitting on years and years of archived emails um, about the projects that you're executing. And if you were to analyze the projects to identify the kinds of phrases and words that were, were used that were correlated to project issues like scope or budget or personnel, then you, know, you might be able to get an early warning signal for projects that are going sideways. Well, someone at Lockheed took that idea then and implemented it, and they're now saving hundreds of millions of dollars of cost, uh, cost overruns and have what they claim um, three, times, three times greater foresight into uh, project issues. Now, there are other companies like Dollar General, that uh, it's like a dollar store, that are uh, actually have self-funding data warehouses by monetizing data directly, selling it uh, data about their, their products and their sales and their inventory um, to their CPG suppliers. Um, Allstate, the insurance company, has um, came to me some years ago and said, uh, what, what um, you know, the, the automobile companies want to buy our claims data, but we can't be seen as selling our customer data, even if we anonymize it and aggregate it and, and de-identify it. So I said, why not set up a separate company to do that? And that's what they've done. They set up a company called Arity um, because it's more of a brand issue than anything. And uh, they're making that data available. Anyway, there are tons of really great examples across the board. And again, I'll, I'll be publishing them. And But if anybody's interested in inspirational examples, uh, just reach out to me. And um, and I connect with you and you know talk to your folks and, and share you know a, a whole slew of, uh, of uh, really cool ideas on, on how organizations have leveraged their data. But I want to get into some of the other topics about managing and measuring data, and then we'll uh, wrap up. You know, take some questions. Um, so managing data. Um, well, let me tell the story here before I share share the nasty image. Um, I, I I met with a, a an energy company, a utility, uh, recently, and they. Who's, I was re reviewing their data strategy, and their data strategy document, like most of them that I see, had the vernacular around, you know, data is our most critical corporate asset, and we want to manage data as an asset, and that kind of stuff. And um, and I said, well, how come there's nothing in here about inventorying your data, maintaining an inventory of what data you have, a catalog or, or anything? And they said, well, yeah, you know, well, you know, we inventory our major assets like our trucks and our transformers and our generators. And I said, well, if, if data is really a critical asset, why don't you take that same approach about knowing what data you have? And, you know, you can't manage it if you don't know what data you have. And they said, well, yeah, you know, maybe that's a good idea. Anyway, after the, the meeting, I, I went into the men's room and this is what I saw. They've inventory tagged all of their toilets and urinals and sinks because, well, why? They're a balance sheet asset, right? And, um, and I see this kind of uh, you know like dichotomy or, or irony in, in organizations where they're inventorying their office supplies. They've got a whole department for um, purchasing office supplies, but they don't have a single person for purchasing data supplies. And so uh, I think we, you know, once we start measuring data as an asset and at least creating internal balance sheets for it, we'll get out of this you know crazy mindset that our toilets are more valuable than our than our data is. Um, but you know, where, what do we, where do we go from there? What do we do? And, and really, again, the whole idea about infonomics is borrowing from things that we've already done. And uh, we can borrow from the way that we're managing physical assets. You know, how, how do we handle raw materials versus in, uh, finished or uh, unfinished inventory or finished goods? Um, what are things that we do from an asset management standpoint regarding storage or maintenance, unplanned or unplanned maintenance? Um, the disposal of assets. Most companies don't even know how, how or when to get rid of their data. Um, and it becomes a risk for them. I'll share an example of a company that um, that kind of took this approach. Safe handling is a big one. I talked to Stats New Zealand. Um, they don't allow anyone to touch data until they've gone through a safe handling training on uh, how to handle data and how to use it properly. Today, many organizations call that data fluency or data literacy projects, but um, uh, Stats New Zealand has a, an actual training program and a certification program for anybody who's who's handling data, which I think is a great idea for any kind of organization. Um, when it comes to uh, um, if you're a financial asset co management company or, or in uh, a bank or an insurance company, maybe you have more experience in financial asset management and you should borrow from some of the principles and practices in, in your industry. Uh, things like managing data as a portfolio rather than as an individual data sets, maybe it makes sense from a, um, an asset management standpoint or a data management standpoint to consider them a portfolio. Um, understand their liquidity, improve their liquidity, reduce their volatility. Those are all concepts that we can apply to, to, da to data as well. 
And if you're a, a, a services firm that deals more in, in ca human capital management, you know, you can borrow from things like recruiting and hiring and training and staffing and um, reviewing the performance of data. When you terminate, again, when you expire data, um, when do you outsource and get data from external sources, or when do you allow temporary data sets to persist or not? Um, there's, again, a lot we can learn from, from each of these um, each of these kind of three main asset uh, disciplines. Um, I know I understand human capital is not considered an asset because we've outlawed slavery, thankfully, um, but um, there's still a lot to be learned from human capital management in the context of, of managing data as an asset. Um, where are these sources of, of inspiration? You can look uh, across any number of, of standard um, principles and practices for managing assets, like the PAS 55 model for physical asset management, or even ITIL in the IT service management space. These are all applicable to the way that we're managing data. But we as data professionals, and I'm as much to blame as anybody, have been making up this stuff as we've gone along the last the last several decades, rather than paying homage to and, and borrowing liberally from the way that other assets are, are managed. Um, and then we have um, the, the idea that um, we, we need to understand how mature our overall capabilities are, not just our technology, but what is our culture around data? Do we actually have a solid strategy for managing and leveraging data? Um, are we understanding the metrics around data, things like measuring the quality and the, um, and the value of data? Are we set up for the right kinds of organization and uh, structure, and, and do we have the right skills? Do we have somebody to curate data? Do we have data scientists? Uh, do we have a, a data economist on board or a digital ethicist? There are all sorts of new um, organizational skills that are really, really uh, important. How well are we deploying data? Yeah, we may be managing it well, but are we actually leveraging it to its full extent? Are we sharing it well enough across the organization? Do we have the architecture that's resilient and scalable and uh, high performance enough? Um, how well are we governing just not just our data, but how well are we governing um, analytics as well? Are we reusing our analytic models sufficiently? Are they being vetted internally before they're deployed? Um, and then we get to technology um, and how well we're leveraging leveraging technology. So you'll see a lot of these kind of concepts f flow through. And if you're familiar with the, the link solution, um, you'll see a lot of this stuff able to be modeled in, um, in, in their environment. Um, and then finally, measuring information as an asset. Um, they're really, you can, you can measure any kind of asset in a number of ways. You can measure its realized value once you're actually using it. You can measure its probable value based on the capabilities that you have to, to leverage that asset. Or you can look at its potential value if you were to apply, you know, if you were to fully apply it. Now, for most organizations, they have these gaps that I call the performance gap and the vision gap, the performance gap between the realized and probable um, asset um, deployment and the vision gap, which is, wow, we really haven't even thought of all the ways to, to leverage data. Um, and there are ways to, to measure these. And so as I started thinking about how to measure data's value, I came across this great quote from uh, Dr. George Box. He's the a British uh, statistician and head of the, uh, I think he was head of the American St uh, Statistical, St Statistical Association, I forget what it was called. Um, but I think he's a Nobel um, Prize winning or Fields Medalist in, in mathematics. Um, and he had this great quote that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so what I'm gonna share with you are some uh, kind of a high level look at how to model um, data's value. They're not perfect models by any means, um, but they're, I'll show you how some, some organizations are actually using them. So there are a few different ways we can model uh, data's value. We can look at it uh, foundationally, you know, non-financially. What is its um, quality? What are its quality characteristics? Or what is its uh, business value? What is its performance value? Um, uh, what? Uh, how well is it? Um, is it driving business value if, once we use it? How well does it map to uh, other kinds of business uh, processes? And then we can also look at the financial side and apply the the way that. Um, any kind of asset is measured on the balance sheet using the cost approach, the market approach, and the uh, or the income approach. Now, there's some nuances there um, that I won't get into in, in, in this call, and they're, they're detailed in, in my book, and I, I do talk about it. But um, we're, we're going to, um, like, for example, the market value of information. Remember, you can use data over and over again. So when we're considering its market value, we're not just looking at selling it once. We're looking at uh, what is the aggregate market value once we continue to deploy it or sell it or license it externally. But the more you saturate the market, the more that value, the, the price for it gets reduced. So um, it's important to, to, consider, to consider that. 
Um, again, I'm not going to share the models here, but um, just to give you an idea of what 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 they include. Now, where things get interesting, and I hadn't really anticipated this, is where some of our clients are are leveraging these models in. Um, they're, they're juxtaposing these models or superimposing these models. So, like uh, uh, Boeing, um, the airline manufacturer came to us and they said, "Well, we've got so much data, we don't know." where to focus um, our, our data management activities. We can't, we need to prioritize. And so, um, uh, I don't know, I, I uh, got a whiteboard, but I don't know if you can see. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna turn that off. Um, what they did is they, they identified data that has a, we helped them identify data that has a, a low IVI, basically a low quality index, but a high business relevancy index. And that was the data they should focus on on managing better. Um, and a large insurance company, uh, uh, financial services company, AIG, um, uh, showed us how they leverage the models to identify data that has a low um, low quality index, but how that maps to, how improving the quality of their data maps to its improved performance. They can actually track how a 1% increase in data um, accuracy or a 3% increase in data, uh, data completeness drives improvements in business process performance for the processes that use that data. Um, another uh, a company came to us, they're a manufacturer of security systems, showed us how they identified data that, um, this is, a, I'm talking about the third example here in the bottom left, um, how they identified data that has a, a high business relevancy but was not currently generating a lot of economic value. And so they sat down and thought through ways to better leverage that data. Like how do they use customer support data in a sales context or how do they use sales data in a manufacturing context? And they identified 20 different ways to better leverage data based on closing the gap between these models um, and ended up adding, um, uh, what did they end up adding? Ended up uh, adding $300 million of market value on a $2 billion business. Now in the upper right corner, um, this kind of represents a lot of companies that that come to us and they ask, what data should we be monetizing? What data should we be better leveraging? And the, the, the basic answer to that is data that has a low cost basis, has a high quality index, and has a high business relevancy, you know, internally and or externally. That's data you should probably be fixated on or, or focused on, on monetizing. Um, the one in the middle on the right, um, is, is really just expressing that you can grow the economic value of any data asset by not just using it internally, but by monetizing it externally as well. And then on the bottom right is an interesting story that came to us from a um, an energy a, a utility company in Indiana here who showed us how they identified data assets that were costing them more to uh, collect and store and secure and manage than the economic value that they were generating. And because they're in a highly regulated industry, there wasn't really a lot more they could do with that data. They couldn't sell it or you know, monetize it externally really. Um, so they were able to make uh, a defensible disposal decision or defensible deletion decision for that data and are now saving millions of dollars a year in unnecessary um, infrastructure expenses or data expenses. So there are tons of stories about how companies are coming to the realization that uh, data is really an asset and how they can use these valuation models to drive certain kinds of behaviors and benefits uh, within the organization. And there are, are plenty of others like in Canada, um, the Canadian National Archives use models, these uh, valuation models to identify which of the archival items to digitize um, and in what uh, uh, priority. So a lot of really cool, cool examples. Um, the last thing I'll talk about, just kind of a bonus topic quickly, is this concept of economics. I've mentioned that a, a couple of times. And you know that for those of you, and most of us have taken kind of an Econ 101 class at, at some point, um, and we're familiar with the, the concepts of supply and demand and productivity frontiers and marginal utility. You know, those, those models were originally designed with, um, with a focus on traditional uh, physical assets like you know guns and butter right and uh those we talk about in you know econ 101 um but nobody's really thought about how well do they apply and do they need to be tweaked um or modified in the context of information so some colleagues and i worked on this for a while and came up with some interesting conclusions about um how they operate differently in the context of information so kind of the infonomics 201 um type of um, type of topic is is about um 
how to what we can learn from applying like the principles of supply and demand or pricing and elasticity to to data um, and what does that mean for producers and consumers of data and how we architect um, architect systems I think what you'll find is you know as you use like the link um, uh, product you'll actually find you're able to define and recognize the nuances of data as it flows through um, through an organization um, and and kind of these con these conclusions will become you know self self evident once you once you model the flow of data and processes and, and people and technology. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to get into detail on them, but again, there's a, there's a topic on this in in my book, and happy to explore this with anyone. I teach a class on infonomics, and my favorite part of the class is when I get to work with the students. Um, uh, the university students uh, on this topic and how they've been able to come up with new kinds of economic models and how they apply to uh, to data and it's been been really really interesting so um, that's a, kind of the part that excites me I'm hoping one of my students goes on to like win a Nobel on this topic some someday <laughs> that's kind of my 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 dream so anyway just to, to wrap up some high level you know, recommendations are you know you want to monetize not just your own data but but uh, other uh, other people's data in a variety and do so in a variety of ways. Don't get fixated just on one way to use data. Don't think about using data just to report on it and use it for some operational purpose. Think about all of the variety of ways to do so. Um, also, you know, consider how you're managing your data assets and do so as best you can with the same kind of discipline as you manage your other assets. Again, if you're a if you're in the financial services industry, apply financial. Um, asset uh, pra practices and principles, or if you're in the manufacturing or retail industry and deal with with physical assets, then apply those kinds of practices. Or if you're in the uh, uh, services industry, then think about how you, how you might apply human capital management practices. Um, next, I just think it's an imperative today um, to measure and, and think about how, measure how you're improving your, your data's potential and, and, and realize value. Um, I think a lot of things will flow from that. Um, I think it's pretty easy to have a conversation with your chief financial officer um, around the topic, which is, listen, I understand data is not a balance sheet asset, but we want to become more of a data-driven organization. And the only way to do that is to start measuring the value of our, our data and, and, uh, and, and list their support in doing so, at least creating some kind of internal balance sheets for the value of data. And then finally, you'll do what you can to understand the, the unique um, economic you know, how, how traditional economic principles and practices apply to, to, to data um, and use that to, to better architect, um, architect your systems. So um, that was a quick tour of the, the topic of infonomics. I hope you all found it you know, interesting. I'm happy to um, you know, address any, any questions that uh, may have come up. I haven't been kind of paying attention to the chat here. Let me take a look. Um, and um, yeah, we'll go from there and kick it back to, uh, kick, kick it back to Neil. Hey Doug, thank you for that. That's sure, just yeah, pleasure. Awesome, as, as ever. Um, we do we do have some questions coming in. Right. Um, there's a really good one here from Suzanne Jones. So she's here in Wellington, Ministry of Justice. <clears throat> Excuse me. She's asked of the, the, the statement, and then the question is: um, ethical considerations are very important in the public sector. Moving from the yes, we can legally use data and information to more of a should we perspective. Yeah. This coming up as a significant consideration in the private sector, or is it largely sitting within the public sector? Absolutely, it's coming up a, a lot. Um, companies are realizing that the reputational risks of using data in particular ways um, can affect the top and bottom line, and, and has for many organizations. Um, many of them tend to recover even after some significant missteps, but it's not a not a great thing to have on the corporate resume that you've you've screwed up with, uh, or like you say down there, you've stuffed it up with uh, with data, right? So. Um, uh, so many organizations are, are hiring or at least enlisting someone who is a digital ethicist that will help them think through the untoward ways that data and analytics might be used um, uh, that, that they really haven't, you haven't, haven't considered. Um, I wrote a, a paper on this while I was with, uh, with Gartner, and I think I did address it in, in the book as well. But there are certain considerations um, to consider whether you're a producer or a consumer of data um, that, that are certainly go beyond the, the, the law into the world of, of, of ethics. Now, the important thing to realize is that not everybody has the same kind of ethical you know, mores. And um, it's important to understand the ethics of the culture that your, 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 uh, where your consumers are, the culture of your own company, 
um, the ethics of, uh, of, of the industry itself and that um, the ethics of various customers will differ from one customer to the next. So um, you know, be very sensitive to, to that. There's no really one size fits all when it comes to ethics uh, as, it, as it does more or less with the, with the law. No, excellent question. question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another one here as well. Um, finance markets took off with the growth of derivatives, speculative assets. Surely data derivatives hmm. expand, um, expand the potential for value without the vo uh, volatility of junk bonds. Great question, Errol. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that means. I, mean, I am familiar with derivatives. I, I worked in uh, advising uh, companies on on how to measure the value of their their collateralized debt obligations, the other CDO, right? Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, the way I might address it is is yes, it's important to think of derivative data as mm -hmm. an additional way to generate value from data. Um, and that happens through analytics. It happens through data integration. Um, it happens through new kinds of identifying new kinds of use cases. But but yeah, a company will find a lot more value once they find derivative data assets. Um, the other way to consider the, the word derivative in that context might be alternative data assets. Um, and many companies are kind of stuck um, either staring at their own navels, you know, when it comes to data or or being kind of fat, dumb, unhappy buying data from one particular purveyor. Um, and, and I think that it's really important for organizations to have an awareness of alternative data uh, assets that are that are out there today. So um, previously you, you discussed um, the need for really understanding what data you have. Um, you talk about the seven sources of data, organizations looking outside of right. their end data. So one of the questions we, we have here is, um, have you seen good examples of information catalogs that people can access in order to help, you know, with that um, initial piece of work, which is what yeah. have I, where is it? I'm not here to give you know, t technical advice. And in fact, I don't, I don't really research tech technologies per se. Um, so, but, but yeah, there are different kinds of characteristics that different data catalogs have. Um, the, the biggest challenge I think is in, is in maintaining that data. Um, you know, right now, a lot of the data catalog providers don't provide a way to, you know, automatically harvest data or maintain it. Um, and I, I think that's coming, um, but um, that that's that'll be an exciting thing for me to see when when that when that happens. And um, there's a, I guess, a slightly related um, question here is once you've got that catalog, mm -hmm. uh, you know where all of your data is. Um, mm -hmm. We're all talking about monetization of the asset, right? So we can have it. Um, on our balance sheet, how long do you think until financial practices change uh, to the point we're allowed to say our yeah. information is worth this much money and it is represented on the balance sheet and therefore the value of an organization? What you know, there have been some, it's a great question, and I think there have been some recent inklings of this. Um, while I say data isn't a balance sheet asset, there are some unique circumstances where it can be. Um, and one of those is if you're a data broker, you know, a syndicated data provider, and you purchase a database from another company, um, you actually are allowed to, according to GAAP, and I think IFRS, um, recognize and depreciate the value of that data set um, as an right. intangible asset. So there are some unique unique cases, but generally most companies can't. Um, there, there, you know, one of the issues is whether that data is internally generated because uh, typically internally generated assets are not, con you know, can't, are not considered uh, balance sheet assets. You expense them, um, but, but you don't consider them assets. So like if I have a point of sale system and I'm collecting data about the sale, is that internally generated or was that, does that come from the customer? So that hasn't really been sorted out by the the accounting firms or the accounting your regulatory bodies. The other issue is how do you recognize it? When do you recognize it? Which valuation methods do you use and when? So that's yeah. all still kind of up in the air. I know the um, AICPA, or is it FASB here in the, in the States, the Financial Accounting Standards Board has had a, a published a discussion paper and had a, a discussion sessions on it. I think there's a great paper that was published by the Australian um, version of the the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Uh, if you want to really want to geek out on it, it's a, it's a great 170 page paper they published um, several uh, several years ago. But um, I, I think still 
you know, for, for general purpose, we're still five to 10 years away from companies being able to quantify the value of their data assets on the balance sheet. One of the issues is, um, <clears throat> you know, who, who's gonna put pressure on the accounting boards to do that? I mean, if you're a CIO or a CFO, raise your hand if you really wanna report on more publicly, you know, then you have to. You know, right now it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a secret, you know, for organizations, it's a, something they can keep close to, to vest. Um, and they don't have to disclose. And so it becomes a particular advantage what data I'm collecting and how I'm using it. Um, and I don't have to disclose that. So uh, there, there's a particular advantage to companies not having to, dis to disclose it. And I think that puts pressure on the accounting standards boards. And there, there are so many other reasons for going through this exercise and understanding the value of information beyond it now features on the balance sheet that that shouldn't stop people exactly. from doing the work today, right? There's all of these other things that we think Great about. Point. that validity of the data, the accessibility, the interpretability, the believability, how people use it for decision-making, all of those things are wrapped up in this whole information value topic. Yeah, it only the accountants get in the way of uh, understanding the value of what you've got. Absolutely. Yeah. So we do have a couple more questions coming through here. Um, what legal provisions do you need in place with third parties in order to use their um, aggregate anonymized data? You need a contract. Right now, the, the, the laws right. barely support the concept of data ownership um, and, and do so inconsistently, as I mentioned. So you need a good contract in place. And most of the, the contracts I've seen where um, you know manufacturers are collecting data off devices and whatever are really not very well crafted. Um, I'm no lawyer, but you know even I can see that there are gaping holes in contracts when it comes to, to data oh. sharing um, and, and the um, uh, and the terms and conditions around how that data can be used. Now we see it, you know, in the in the social media world, where pretty much every social media company has a user agreement that says we can capture, uh, we we can use any data we capture from you in any way at any time. We can even modify it, and we have unlimited, um, you know, perpetual rights to do so. Right. So, you know, try to get away with that in a B two B world, and you might have come up with a, a little difficulty, but. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to, um, to to structure those agreements, and most lawyers are are really not well equipped to deal with those issues. There, you know, there are some people who who are. Um, there's a, one of my colleagues at, at Gartner, Lydia uh, Jones, is a former attorney, and she's been writing a lot about the topic of of uh, the legal issues around around uh, data contracts and, and data residency and and um, so uh, yeah, she's done some some great work on that topic. But yeah, get your get your lawyers educated on it and get your contracts buttoned up. And um, yeah, it's a big that's going to be going to be a big issue. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, there's a great question here from Elizabeth. Um, so information we we often talk about it, it has a value, but there's also a risk. Um, dark data in particular, when we capture it, we store it. Um, it's unstructured potentially inside the business. Could have huge potential value there if it was released inside the organization. So Elizabeth is asking about um, this balance between information value and information risk. So yeah. she says, um, you know, it's increasingly pervasive in business. Absolutely. Um, unlike assets, the more data is used, the more valuable it becomes, as long as it's used appropriately. And right. you know, we're we're adding and not detracting value. On the other end, how are the risks? relying on uh, computer generated data and information being considered and properly managed? Um, what I would say most organizations are not properly managing that, you know, they have um, some governance policies that are not monitored or enforced or they're lacking sufficient data governance policies or analytic governance policies even as well. Mm -hmm. um, so most companies are not really on top of that. Um, and so the lack of data governance you know, does introduce particular, particular uh, material risks to an organization. And when we evaluate companies as part of those M&A transactions that I talked about, one of the things we are looking at is how well their governance, governance processes are defined, but also how well they're implemented and enforced. You know, do they have the, the carrots and sticks attached to them that uh, give them give them teeth? So um, I don't know if that answers the, you know, it fully answers the question, but um, I hope so. As, yeah, more, more work's needed. I think as, as we, we will begin to um, potentially not understand data that's been created by human beings versus created by a machine or an AI. Um, and that's gonna introduce a lot of new conversation into the whole data and information management sector for sure. Um, yeah. 
So sure. let's finish off with it. There's, there's just a couple more. Um, in the context of information asset value, can you expand a little on marginal utility principle in infonomics? Um, uh, probably beyond the, the scope that we have you know, right now, but um, I, I would encourage you to, to uh, you know, check out the chapter in, in the book on that. Sure, but, it's, yeah, it's a big, uh, there, right? that's kind of a big, big hairy, hairy subject. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, indigenous data ownership interest is a significant area in New Zealand yeah. under the treaty that we have. Mm -hmm. um, any, any kind of thoughts on any anything that we need to do differently to um, consider those indigenous rights of data? Is it just wrapped up in the same part of the conversation? It's good governance of information. That's a great, uh, a, a really great topic. And and I did write in, in my book, there is one story about um, the indigenous peoples um, monetizing uh, as part of the Kyoto Protocol, being able to monetize the information that they had gleaned over 40,000 years on how to manage, uh, how to do land management. I don't right. recall the exact details of the story, but it's really true, truly wonderful story on how, how, uh, uh, how a verbal story itself had been monetized to the tunes uh, to the tune of of hundreds of thousands of dollars for for a particular indigenous people. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Um, there is a question about uh, digital twins and valuing those assets. Um, we we are going to have a follow on session that people can sign up to where we're going to explore a bit more about how um, Link is applying some of these principles around economics. Um, in that, in the construct of the digital twin of the organization, so maybe yeah, we can. I encourage everyone them. to attend. It's it's really really cool um, how how you can create those digital twins. So um, I think we're probably there. Uh, look, there are, there are a load of other questions. Maybe what I'll do is share them with you um, afterwards, sure. and um, you know, people will be I think happy to follow up. There is a there is a lot of interest down mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll put them up uh, on LinkedIn for everybody to view. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that would be that would be brilliant. I, you know, I, I personally think we need more of this type of conversation going on here, so that we are um, in touch with the topic and we're doing everything we can. Yeah. So I think um, uh, we're we're a couple of minutes away from the top of the hour. Um, this is a Tony's question. Tony's got a good question there. Tony has. Oh, Tony yes. Mark. Okay. Uh, something yeah. I didn't really bring up about the IT organization. Um, you know, I think it's bottom line is I think it's high time to split the IT organization into separate I and T organizations. You know, there was a point in time where data and technology were tightly coupled, maybe the 1960s and 70s and maybe the 80s to some degree. But now we've seen this decoupling the database is separate from the software and the hardware. Um, and um, you know, certainly as we move data to the cloud, that decoupling is, is even uh, uh, happens even further. Um, I, I think, it, you know, organizationally, we need to think about managing data as a separate asset than technology. Uh, and the faster that we get away from that, uh, the better. I know that there are some organizations down your way, like Kohl's, um, uh, that has a separated IT organization into separate I and T organizations. So it's a, it's a trend that I'd like to see happen more and more. No, I'm 100% behind you there. Yeah. I think uh, re remembering information technology, not just technology, is mm -hmm. critical for making sure the business is driving a lot of this conversation rather than the technology yeah. aspect of it. And, and data is a data is a business asset, not a not a technology uh, asset, not absolutely. an IT asset. Yeah. <clears throat> so Scott's made it back. Uh, he had a obviously had some kind of catastrophic failure and has missed. Um, 10 minutes of the Q&A, but he's back. So I'm going to hand back over to him to just, just wrap up um, and we can finish this session off. But from my perspective, you know, thanks for your time. Um, as ever, it's been insightful, interesting, you. Um, challenging, which is great. So uh, yeah, great to see you. Thanks for your time, Doug. You too. Hope to see you live in person soon. Yeah, definitely. Keep well, everyone. Oh, Scott, you're on mute, which is the term of the of 2020 isn't it uh you're on mute. yeah well it, we'll have to get that shirt of yours produced that uh you're on welcome to zoom you're on mute um yeah thanks for looking after that so um lots of people have asked whether we're going to have a recording so i'm looking forward to it as well but uh <laughs> but uh as you said i wrote one thing down that really resonated for me because i've got a bit of an hr background for my sins i did a couple of years of with hr with one of the largest uh, telcos in new zealand and uh, love the idea of, of performance management of your data. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, would you, would you rehire or would you fire, fire your data? And, uh, 
I think having some say, and I and I just bugged out when you guys were talking about data cataloging and all that sort of stuff and managing your data, but mm. some some way of even just monitoring where it's used and its usefulness and whether it's still relevant, I think is is fantastic. Um, and while I was gone, one of the things that we wanted to do for you, um, Doug, is to is to promote your book, obviously. But um, uh, but we're also very keen if anyone out there and people are dropping off because we're winding up. But if anyone's out there that wants to um, pre-order your upcoming book, then um, uh, they've got my details, so they can they can send me a note and we'll we'll keep them informed about that. Um, uh, we're all uh, excited about about that coming out. And um, and the last offer is um, uh, to for anyone who's interested in um, what's been going on. I'm sure everyone is is that they can click on the button there and schedule a call to explore things further, um, explore with Neil the um, uh, the way that Link can be used to um, practically um, apply the principles that you're talking about, Doug. So, um, yeah, once again, thank you very much for your time. Um, hopefully we can convince you to come back and share some time with us again after the launch of your, of your new book and um, we really, really appreciate it. Can't wait. Thanks. Be well, everyone. Yeah, yeah. take care. Stay safe. See you soon, Doug. Right. Cheers. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, guys.